Where I'm in to? Lima, in Lima, Peru, South America. Oh, South America. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, we're Have you been? Here. Have you been to South America? I was in Brazil, actually. Ah, my mother is from Brazil. Your mother is from Brazil? Yeah, from Rio. Yeah, I was in. Uh, <clears throat> ooh, I was in Morombi. In Morombi, where is that? In the jungle? No. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I think it's. Uh, I don't know. I was there for oh. one week. I was there for oh, one okay. week no uh, for Pesach. Ah, no, no, no. Many years ago. I see. Oops. Oh, here. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I. That was it. That was it for my South America adventure. South America <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and at the moment you live in Montreal as well, as yeah. your father? Ah, yeah. Yeah. Have you parlé français? No. Yeah. Just English. Okay. I speak a little. Which uh, which language is next to your name? Is that Chinese? I beg your pardon? No, that's Japanese. Japanese? Yeah. Nice. Be because my name is too long in Japanese. I use a shorter version of my name. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Very cool. Yes. Anyway, have a nice day, everybody. Cheers. All right. Nice to meet you. Me too. Thank you. All right. Hi to Liba and Davida. And Hi, Rabbi Menti. Hello, hello. I'm just here, and David is with us. Hello, David. I'm just here waiting to pass on the mic. So I'm the uh, <clears throat> I'm the keynote speaker. You know what the keynote speaker is? The guy that gets a key with the note saying "lock up when you finish." But I'm the keynote speaker in the beginning. I just open the door to let you in. But any moment now, you should be having. One of the rabbis, one of the rabbi finds. Come join us. We are live on Facebook. And that's about it. Okay, so hello, hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, hello Diane. Hello. <laughs> hello, Asher. And Dennis is with us. Okay, I'm just uh, filling in till one of the rabbis finds, come on. But I figure while we're waiting, we could do some commerce. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right, let's do that. So let me, let me get out of here. Figure out how to share the screen. There we go. Okay. Dear Chumash, there we are. Share screen. And here it is. Okay. 
Today is Wednesday, 19th of Av. Let's jump right in. Again, I'm just filling in until one of the rabbis' finds comes on. So uh, we'll do what we can. At that time, Amar Hashem Eli Salachash Nenuchay Savan. This is Moshe in the middle of his speech. And at this point, we are at after the golden calf. And after Moshe pleads on the behalf of the Jewish people, as Rashi will explain to us at length, so the Almighty tells him to make a second pair of tablets after he broke the first. So let's see that inside with the Rashi. Hello, David. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to continue. I'm not going to repeat my speech every time someone comes on, but if anybody wants to just put it on the uh, chat, then let's let everybody know. I'm just filling in. It is a daily Rambam class, and I'm just waiting. We're just waiting for one of the rabbi's finds to come on. So hope that doesn't confuse. Oh, look at that. I think one of the rabbi's finds are stepping on, stepping in. Um... Um, and I saw him. Okay. Joseph, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, he's there. Okay, I thought I saw you. Come on. Oh, there. Okay, there's a chair. All right. You uh, are you ready to? You want me to continue? Do you want to take over? Ready to rock and roll. Ready to rock and roll. Fantastic. So I'm going to make you the host. Thank you, Rabbi Mendy. Matt, <laughs> we got to say a few words of Torah together. My pleasure. Ah, uh, hosts. Make Have a good day. Host. Make a host. Okay. Yosef, you're the host. Okay, got it. I'm pulling up the Rambam here. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Rabbi Mendy, for the, the smooth transition. Good morning. So opening up the Rambam here. Okay. Let's share a screen here. Let's do this. Okay. Okay, let's begin here. Can begin here on a Tuesday, uh, what are we, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, we are here continuing the chapters of Maimonides of Rambam on the laws of Shabbat, chapter number 24. Thank you. All right. Number, number one. There are activities that are forbidden to do on a Shabbat, not because they resemble labor, only because it says in the Torah, if you restrain your feet because of Shabbat from pursuing the, the, your desires on my holy day. And it also says, that's in... Uh, uh, Isaiah also says, and you shall honor it from following your ways, which means that on Shabbat, you should try to change your ways a little bit and more focus on God than on yourself. What you shouldn't be talking about, you shouldn't go to your partner and say, like, what should we buy tomorrow? What should we sell? Which stock should we invest or not? What should we build? What should we not build? Talking is what you should not be doing on Shabbat in regards to this, but thinking it is permitted. You also should not be walking in your gardens and check what do you need to do to fix the vines and fix the grapes. Because the, again, you're doing, you're pursuing your desires. Likewise, you're not allowed to walk on Shabbat outside of the city 
2,000 amos. So what we're saying is don't walk, don't walk all the way to the end of 2,000 amos on Shabbat and say, you know what, right when Shabbat is over, I'll continue walking. Because then during Shabbat, you're, you're pursuing your, your own desires. The, what, the above applies only if you're going to be doing something after Shabbat that is forbidden to do on Shabbat. But if you're going to do something that is permitted, then you can. The only thing is getting there, then we say you're allowed to get, you're allowed to go all the way to the to, to the end of 2000 Amis, wait there till Shabbat is over, and then continue. You're allowed to wait there if you're not allowed to wait there if you're going to go rent or or pay workers, but to watch fruit, you're allowed to because that's allowed to be done on Shabbos. So, Mashiach Lavi Behema, or you pay a solution, Shabbos, Kere, Lavi, Hiba, Apa, Pishi, Husat Kum, Pay a solution, Eloha, Yisham, Hitz, and Mutta Lavi, Shabbos. Um, you're allowed to go all the way to 2,000 arms to call an animal to come because the animal is going to come on its own. And likewise, you're allowed to take fruit that are already plucked um, already and they're not connected to the ground. Or the tree. Also, you're allowed to tell a friend, I'm going to this and this city tomorrow for if there was a chain of huts located between the two places meeting, you only let it go. The idea of going, not going more than two thousand amos, is outside of the city. But if there were small houses all the way, you're allowed to go because the city continues. So really, this type of thing you're allowed to go. So on Shabbat only because there's missing huts. Therefore, you can wait there all the way till the end of Shabbat and then continue going. Mutter number four. Mutter la de leimel apoy la nir shetamoy imi la erev. You're allowed to tell a person or a, work, a person allowed to tell a worker, uh, you know, meet me in the evening time, meaning meet me right after Shabbat. But, uh, but you're not allowed to say, be prepared for me for the evening. You know, be like, you know, prepare yourself. You're not allowed to run or jump a Shabbat. Because you should, that's what you do during the week. You let it go down into a little, uh, uh, you, you're allowed to go down a, a, in a cistern or a pit or a cave to get water, even if it's it's a long walk, um, and come back. And also, what you, the I, it is forbidden to have extensive idle talk, idle talk, matters meaning just random schmoozing on shabbat because it you should it change the way you speak from shabbat like you speak during the weekday you're allowed to run. We say you're allowed to run on Shabbat if you're going to synagogue or you want to catch the minion or you're going to do a mitzvah. You're allowed to you're allowed to do measurements and count if it's for a mitzvah. Let's say to know if the mitzvah is kosher because it has enough water. Um, you're um, you're allowed to do something that the whole community needs to, even if it means to go. Um, even if it uh, even if it means that you have to go to the halls of the Gentiles on Shabbat. Um, you're allowed to speak about arranging a marriage. Uh, you're allowed to speak about arranging study for children. And you're allowed to go visit the sick. And you're allowed to go comfort the mourners. If you go visit the sick on Shabbat, you should, you should say, that Shabbat, that it is Shabbat, and the Shabbat should heal you. You're allowed to wait all the way to the end of the, the, the space that you're allowed to walk on Shabbat, which is 2,000 Amois, in order to help for a, a bride, uh, for a wedding, and to bring the the uh, the Tachrichin. Those are the garments that, that someone needs to be buried in. 
You're allowed to tell somebody, you know, if you can't find the the the, the garments for a person, a deceased person over there, you can go over there. And if, it, if it's going to cost this amount, you can give there. You can you can pay more because these are things of mitzvah. Therefore, you're allowed. But if it was personal things, then you were not allowed to do that on Shabbat. You're allowed to go on a ship on the Mediterranean Sea on Friday if you're doing a mitzvah. And you should tell him that uh, he should stop for Shabbos. Uh, you're, uh, you're allowed to nullify an oath vows on Shabbat, whether it's for Shabbat or not for Shabbat. So Shabbat so and even if you had time to do it before Shabbat, you're allowed to ask a, a sage to nullify your vow, because that is a mitzvah. Number seven. You, you're not allowed to give punishment. Uh, the court cannot give punishment on Shabbat, even though it is a mitzvah to do that. You're not, if somebody is in court and he needs to get lashes or he needs to be put to death for the violation that he did, you don't do it on Shabbat because it says in the Torah, you should not light fire. And one of the deaths that were done, there's four types of deaths. One of them was with fire. So just like you can't do fire, you can't do any of the other deaths. You have to wait till after Shabbat. Mutter. Number eight. If you're allowed to guard your fruit and vegetables on Shabbat, whether they are attached or not attached, and if somebody comes, you're allowed to scream at them and push them away that they don't touch your stuff. So the Maimon is asking the question, isn't this something for your own personal gain? Why is that okay to do it on Shabbat? He said, because what are we saying that you're not going to go for personal things is to buy things, is to try to gain more and try to uh, amass more stuff. That we say is not allowed. But to guard something that's yours, of course you're allowed. He, and he says, this would be compared to locking your door so thieves don't come into your house. Of course you're allowed to do that on Shabbat. Number nine. If somebody's protecting his grain from the birds or he's protecting cucumbers or squash from the beasts, from the animals, he shouldn't clap his hands and dance like he does during the week because we're afraid that he's going to pick a pebble and throw it more than four amot in a public domain. Number 10. So all of these things that we spoke about, they, they fall in the category of shavut, meaning it's not considered labor, but you still shouldn't do it. So therefore, because it's not considered labor, therefore in the twilight zone, we said something that's labor, you shouldn't do it in the twilight zone. But these things you're allowed to do it because it's not as strict. There has to be a mitzvah for a specific reason you need it. You're allowed to go on top of a tree or go into the water to go bring a lulav or a shofar. Also, you're allowed to go down from a tree and, and from a caramelist uh, after a, you, uh, when you're making an eru. Also, if you are concerned or you had anxiety about something specific and it's a shvut, you're allowed to do it in, in the toilet. Um, um, therefore, you don't bring miser for something, uh, you don't give the miser for something that you, you need to eat during the twilight zone, but you're allowed to do it for something that's the my meaning something that is is a doubt that you need it or not, and in that case, you're allowed to do it. Number 11. <laughs> therefore, something that's a shvut, if a child is doing it, 
uh, let's say he's uh, plucking out from a plant, a plant that's not connected to the ground, or he's carrying in a caramelist. These type of things, you, the basin does not have to stop him. And likewise, a, a father doesn't have to rebuke him. Uh, number 12. Our sages said that you're not allowed to carry uh, certain objects on Shabbat. And why? Why? What do they have against carrying? So he says, just like we tell you, you're not allowed to speak and you're not allowed to walk on Shabbat like during the weekday. So of course, you, you shouldn't also carry because then what are you going to do? You're not going to have what to do. So you're going to start carrying things here and there. And instead of focusing on Shabbat, it's a day for God Almighty to study and to learn and to connect. You're going to be busy doing things. So therefore, they said, don't carry on Shabbat. Number 13. Also, another reason for it is, a second reason is because we're afraid when you start carrying things, maybe you'll see something that needs to be fixed and you do it on Shabbat, and that is definitely forbidden. And also because there are the lady gears, as they say, there are people that don't work. And if, and, 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 you know, people that worked and Shabbat, you can see clearly is different because Shabbat, they're not working. But what if you don't work? Uh, you know, you're, you're retired or you're doing other things, right? So then what's Shabbat going to be different than Monday? It's the same for you. So therefore, we're kind of adding specific things on Shabbat to, that it should be noticeable to you that Shabbat is different. And therefore, this is for everybody. Um, and therefore, they made it forbidden to carry on Shabbat unless it's something that you really need, like we will explain in the future chapters. All right, finish chapter number one for today, which was number 24. Moving on to chapter number 25. There are certain utensils that are permitted to use on Shabbat. For, ex for example, a cup to drink and a plate to, to eat and a knife to cut and a hatchet to crack open nuts. Those are fine. You can use them on Shabbat. Number two, then there are utensils that are forbidden to use on Shabbat, and that is like a grinder, a mill. These things are forbidden because you're not like grinder, mill on Shabbat or crush on Shabbat. Number three, any utensil that is permitted to be to be uh, carried on Shabbat, it doesn't matter what it's made from, whether it's wood, whether it's er, 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 made it from uh, metal or from stone or from the er, from earthen uh, type of uh, vessels. Whether you're moving it for yourself or you're moving it for the benefit of the vessel, uh, or because you need the space that the vessel is, you're allowed to do it. Now, what if this utensil is something that you're uh, you're not allowed to, like we spoke earlier? It doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what the material it is, is what the material of what it's made out of. You're only allowed to move it if you need if it's for the um, for the benefit of the actual vessel, let's say it was out in the sun or was out in the rain, you want to move it, or because you need the space, it's on the table and you want to set up a Shabbat meal, so you're allowed to move it, but for your own benefit, that you can't do. Number four. <laughs> what, is, what, what does this imply? What is implied? You're allowed to carry a plate, a, a wooden plate to eat in it, or to sit where the wooden plate was, or that no one should steal it, meaning move it inside. That's considered doing it for itself. And likewise, you're allowed to take it in from the sun or from the rain, um, because then you're, it's the benefit of the vessel. That's what you're doing it for. Number five. 
Oy, leishim bimkam. You're also allowed to move a mill or a grinder in order to crack nuts on it or to climb. You want to use it to climb on a couch, on a bed on it. This is what it means to use it, to use it for a purpose that is permitted. You're not allowed to move it uh, just so it doesn't break or that nobody should steal it. That is not allowed. Number six. Um, anything that's not a vessel, for example, stones, money, rods, beams, those are forbidden to touch on Shabbat. A massive beam that is that is considered to be a utensil, even if it takes 10 people to carry it, you're allowed to carry it. Doors, even though they may, you may think that they're a vessel, you're not going to touch on Shabbat. So if a door falls off the hinge, uh, uh, your hinge is just put it on the side. Don't touch on Shabbat. Earth, sand, and a corpse, you may not be moved from its place on Shabbat. Also an infant that's born in the eighth month, um, although he is alive, he's considered as a stone and is forbidden to move on Shabbat. Number seven. You are allowed to carry a utensil to perform tasks other than those for which it's intended to be used. What is that? Ketan. Give you a few examples here. Here are a few examples of things that you you can use a utensil for something not for its specific uh, what you usually use it for. You're allowed to use a hammer to crack nuts, a hatchet to cut dried figs, a saw to cut cheese, a rake to collect dried figs, a winnowing shovel um, or a pitchfork to feed a child, a a, um, a weaver uh, to pierce with a, a sack back or a needle to pick a lock or a millstone to sit on it. And this will work in all other scenarios as well. Number eight, a person may carry a sewing needle that is whole to remove a splinter. If, however, its head or its point has been broken, you can't carry it. If it was, if it didn't pierce the hole on top of the needle yet, then you can't carry it. Number nine. If you have a type of utensil that you're worried about, um, that it's going to get ruined. It's a, it's very expensive, or you use it for business. That you're not allowed to carry, and the reason is it's called muktzah. It's muktzah because of the financial loss that may be caused. He brings a few examples, a large saw, a knife-like point of a plow, a butcher's knife, a leather worker, a leather worker's knife, a carpenter's plane, a perfume maker's mortar, any of those that uh, those are not allowed to, you're not allowed to touch them on Shabbat. Number 11, number 10, sorry. Kokli Shutza Maximus Easter, also little tatloy. All utensils that were set aside because of uh, um, because it was uh, forbidden, it's forbidden to be carried. For example, anything that was that as a Shabbat started was set aside and you weren't allowed to touch it then, you're not allowed to touch it now. For example, a candle that was lit on a candelabra, you're not allowed to touch the candelabra because the candle's on it. Now, even when the candle's uh, extinguished, you're still not allowed to carry it. Number 11. In contrast, a utensil that's set aside because it's repulsive, uh, a, a kerosene lamp or, you know, a, a, you know, a, um, a, a party that somebody went to the bathroom, that you're allowed to carry on Shabbat. Number 12. The, the, the doors of any utensils that may be carried on Shabbat, the door of a box, a chest, or a cabinet, if it falls off, you're allowed to carry that. And likewise, any utensil that you're allowed to carry and it broke 
and the pieces you can somewhat use for what the original utensil was able to be used for, you'll have to carry it in Hashemav. Ketsa, shivir e'ar evil chasbon, as piya chavis, shivir stuchs chasbon, as piya pach, peri gav zav, ulim e'na shvarim, ulim lachik pa, also tachbon. If a broken piece of a, need, uh, 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 of a kneading uh, utensil can be used to cover an opening of a jug or broke a piece of glass can be cover, can cover an opening of a flask, then you can use them. But if there's no use for it, then you can touch it. If there's no use for it, don't touch it. Number 13. Any, any uh, cover of utensils, any, uh, you're, allowed to, uh, you're allowed to touch them on Shabbat. How you clean the cover of Bakaka, can have a tumor of art. Image because you should base a his metal noise of him, lame metal noise. Any uh, utensil that is, is connected to the ground, a barrel that's embedded in the ground, if, they, if the cover has a handle, then you can touch it on Shabbat. And likewise, if you have a, a, a pot, you know, the, the, uh, the, the covering of the cistern or the ditches that you have on, you have on the streets or any of those, uh, anywhere outside, then if it has a handle, then you're allowed to carry on Shabbat. On Shabbat. Uh, on Shabbos, the covering of a uh, of an oven is allowed to be touched even if it doesn't have a handle. Number fourteen. If you have two things, one you're allowed to, this one you're allowed to carry, this one you're not allowed to carry, and they're on top of each other or they're connected to each other. If you're going to take one, you'll be able to take. You're going to end up taking the other or touching the other. You're allowed to do it. If the one that you're allowed to touch um, is, is, is the one that you need, then you can touch that, even though you'll end up touching the one that you're not allowed to touch. But if it's the one that you're not allowed to touch is the one that you want, don't touch the one that you're allowed in order to end up moving the one that you're not allowed. Kate what is implied here? If uh, when a fig is buried in straw or a cake is lying upon coals, what uh, you're allowed to you're allowed to pierce them with a uh, spinder or a weaver sho- shovel to remove them, even though the straw or the coals will be moved. Likewise, if a turnip or a radish is buried in the earth, and if you grab the, the turnip or the radish, some earth is going to move, that's fine. But if you have a child that's sitting on a stone, or you have some food on a stone, don't grab the stone, because the stone is what you're not going to touch. Don't grab it in order to grab the child. Uh, number 16. Uh, a person may pick up his son or daughter if if you know strict if they're quetchy for you please pick me up even though they're holding a stone or the but not if they're holding money because we're afraid if they hold money the money the, the money will fall and the father will pick it up when a basket has a hole and a stone has been used to plug it, then you're allowed to carry that basket. The following rules apply if a basket is filled with fruit and a stone is uh, among the fruit. If the fruit is soft, like grapes or berries, the basket may be carried as is. If one spills out the fruit, it would be spoiled by the earth, so therefore we're not afraid that you're going to carry it. Number 17. If you have a, a, a if you forget a stone on top of a, a jug, just tip the jug, you know, that touch the stone of Shabbat, so tip the jug and the stone will fall. What if this jug was between other jugs? You can't tip it, lift it up, move it, and then let, let then tip it and let the stone fall off. Uh, Likewise, if you left money on a pillow, just move the pillow and the money will fall. If you need the place where the pillow is, just pick up the pillow and move it. If you intentionally place the money on the pillow, or you intentionally put the stone there, then you can't move it on Shabbat, because that was done intentionally and, 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 uh, and has become a base 
the pillow or the jug for something that's forbidden. Number 18. One second. Sorry, getting a little hot in here. We have to get the AC going. We're in California here. All right, number 18. A stone that is placed in an earthenware bucket, if it does not fall out when, one, when you draw water, it's considered part of the bucket. But if it does fall out, then it's then it's not considered part of the bucket. And a garment that is hanging on a, a reed may be slipped off from the reed on Shabbat. Number 19. There are certain fruits that are forbidden to eat. For example, fruits that you didn't give the miser yet, you didn't give miser rishon, you didn't give truma, these things you're not allowed to eat. So if you're not allowed to eat it, you can't touch it on Shabbat. But the mai, you're allowed to because poor people can eat it. And likewise, miser sheni, um, also, and also hector, something that you gave to the holy temple that you, that you exchanged it, that is allowed to be eaten, even if you didn't give away the extra fifth. So therefore, because you're allowed to eat it, you're allowed to touch it. Number 20. Uh, you're, uh, 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 you're allowed to carry truma, even though it's not for you. And you're allowed to carry truma, which is impure, together with, uh, with pure, or truma together with regular food, if they were in one vessel. That is only if the pure one is on the bottom. So therefore, you need to take everything. But if the pure one's on top, better shuffle it out just and, and eat that. Um, but if you need the place where the vessel is, then you, in, in any case, you can move it. Number 21. A person has in mind to sit on a row of stones before Shabbat, if you prepare them, then you could. If you didn't, then you can't. When a person gathers branches and date palms and you had a mind to sit it, sit on it, then you can sit on a Shabbos. Also, if you sat on it before Shabbat, then definitely you can move them on Shabbat. Number 22. A straw that is on the bed, um, you... Uh, you, you may move it, however, move it with, with your body better. If animal can eat it, then you are allowed to move it. You don't need to use your body. Also, a pillow or a sheet that's placed on it, it's considered as if you sat on it before Shabbat, and therefore you're allowed to. If somebody put, brought a container filled with earth in his home, if it was set aside before Shabbat, then you're allowed to move it around and use it for whatever you need on Shabbat. Number 23, you're not allowed to take a utensil that and, and make it that you, that you're not going to negate the possibility of using this utensil on, on Shabbat. Okay, so what is that? What, is, what are we referring to? You can't take a, 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 a cup or a bowl that you can use, and then you're going to put it under a candle in order to get the, grab the oil that's dripping. Because then you're taking, then what you're doing is you're negating the possibility of, of using this utensil on Shabbat. And that's considered, that goes under the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the category of destroying, which is not allowed to be done on Shabbat. You're not allowed to put a, a vessel under a, a chicken, a, 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 a chicken to receive the eggs, but you're allowed to put it on top of the eggs because then you can always take it off. And likewise, you can do it for anything. You cover anything with a vessel because you can always just take it away. 
Number 24. A person may, may place a, uh, a a vessel under dripping water because then you can always just you can always use that. Pour out the water and use it. That is only if you if the water is clean, then you can always use the vessel. But if the water is dirty, then you can't. Um Number 25. A barrel containing wine or oil of Tebel that broke, you're allowed to put another vessel under it in order to in, uh, in order to save all the food in there. Likewise, you can put a vessel under a candle that's giving out sparks because the sparks are not considered something that will make the vessel not be able to be touched. Likewise, a beam that broke, only put a bench or a bed under it to hold it as long as you can always take it away if you need it. You may spread a mat over stones or over a beehive on Shabbat because you want to save it from the sun or from the rain. Um, as long as you're not, as long as you're not trying to capture the bees when you're doing that. And the reason why you're allowed to do it because you can remove it any time of Shabbat. And likewise, um, you may overturn a basket to let the chickens or other little animals to climb on it because you, when they're off of it, you can always use that uh, that basket or that vessel. Number 26. Also, if an animal falls into a cistern of water, um, if you could put food there and drink there for the animal to survive to after Shabbat, do that and then lift it up after Shabbat. But if it can, um, make sure you put pillows and blankets there so the animal could try to get out on its own. Even though you're taking these pillows and blankets and you're throwing it, and now you can't use these pillows and blankets till after Shabbat, but because of Tzar Balachayim, which means because we don't want to, because the animal's suffering, therefore you're allowed to do it on Shabbat. Also, it's forbidden to lift an animal in order to bring it from place to place, but you can kind of maneuver it, push it, and try to you know guide it to go into the right place. Likewise, if a chicken runs away, you're not going to grab it because then it tries to free itself and you end up plucking the wings while it's trying to free itself. But you are allowed to push it until it enters the coop. With that, we finish chapter number two for today. Moving on to chapter number three for today, which is chapter number 26. All the utensils used for weaving the cords, the reeds, may be carried, may, may be carried other utensils that are used for forbidden tasks. Um, the, the exception is made regarding the upper weaver beam and the lower weaver beam. They may not be carried because they are fixed. Similarly, the pillars may not be moved um, from the weaver, from the machine that you're weaving with. Uh, brooms made of date branches. Like uh, that's how they used to make brooms back in the day. Or, and you're using it to sweep the floor or a broom made out of other material allowed to because you're allowed to sweep the floor on Shabbos. Bricks that remain after building, um, they're considered, the, they're considered, you can use them because you can recline on them. Um, so therefore you're allowed to use them. If however, one collects them, uh, then it's evident that he's setting it aside and then it's forbidden to carry on Shabbat. Number three, 
a small little pot, you're allowed to carry it on Shabbat, even a public domain, because you can use it, they can use it in a courtyard to be covered to cover the opening of a small utensil. Um, if the stopper of a barrel, let's say you have a cork or something like that, um, you're allowed to be carried on Shabbat, but if you throw it in the garbage, then you can't. Um, a, 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 a If if a utensil has been broken, watch you shouldn't be you, you shouldn't remove the shards from it to use it to cover other things to uh, to support other uh, other utensils. Number four, mutlachlis beisa kisei shleish abanam mekurzolis kanech banam kamishirik layat. Uh, back in the day, they didn't have tissues, and the way they used to wipe after going to the bathroom was they used to use small stones, very smooth stones. So you're allowed to set those aside before Shabbat. Um, but if you you shouldn't use something that's going to fall apart, you could you can bring these stones on top of the roof in order to use it uh, going to the bathroom. A stone that has filth on it, um, it, you can still use it. You can still clean it and use it on Shabbat. Um, even if it's a big stone, if it was meant to use for you, you're going to the bathroom, you're allowed to use it. Number five. If a person has a choice, either using a stone or something made out of the earth, better use a stone. If, however, the uh, the, the one from made, made from uh, the earth comes from the handle of a utensil, one should use one should use the shard. If you have a stone or grass, if the grass is soft, then better use that. Number six. Um, if you have mats that kind of been worn out or tattered, they are considered utensils that are allowed to use on Shabbat because you can you you can cover filth with it. But it has to have at least um, the the size of three fingers because uh, three fingers by three fingers. Anything smaller than that, nobody will use it. So therefore, you can't touch it on Shabbat. Broken pieces of an oven is permitted to carry. However, one leg of the of a range that has slipped from its place, it may not be carried unless it's fixed back, fixed in its place. Um, a ladder leading up to a loft is forbidden to carry Shabbat. But if it's a ladder um, that is is used um, for a shayvach. That's where you know a little bir uh, birdhouse or something like that. That you're allowed to. Have. But you can't carry it from one little birdhouse to the other because that's what you're doing during the weekday. Um, a rod that is used to harvest olives um, that is considered a vessel that's not should, should not be used on Shabbos. Um, a reed that someone that a person uses to open and close doors, they're allowed to use that on Shabbat. Number eight. Um, a door that once had a hinge, though right now it doesn't have a hinge, which, which is prepared to close uh, the yard. Um, um, if, 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 whether you have a cloth hanging on the wall or other things that are meant to close openings, then you're allowed to do it as long as it's connected to the wall. The same rule applies um, with a mat that drags on the floor. If, as, uh, as long as they were above the ground, then it can be used. Number nine. A door that is made from a single piece of wood 
which is placed in a doorway to close and to be removed to open it, if the doorway does not have a base at the bottom that resemble a doorpost, um, then this, this is not allowed to be used to close the door on Shabbat. Similarly, a bolt that has a bolt on it at the end that indicates that it's a utensil that's used to bolt the door, this may be used on Shabbat because it's clear that it's being it's 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 used to close the door. Number 10. Negash ein beroisha klustera imayakasha vitals bedalas noilimboy. A bolt that does not have a, 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 a kind of something at the end of it. If it is tied to the door and suspending from it, then you're allowed to use it on Shabbat. Also, this applies when it's carried together with a rope and it's attached to the door. But if it's a separate thing that you use, let's say, you know, you close the door, then you take a beam in order to, to lock the door, that's no good because it's not connected to the door and it doesn't, it's not clear that this is a utensil used to lock the door, you, so therefore you're not allowed. It. Number 11. A candle, a candelabra, but that has se- several parts to it, you're not allowed to carry it on Shabbat. So you can carry it if a uh, has if it has grooves and it appears to resemble one that is made from several parts but it's not from several parts if it's very very large then you shouldn't and you have to use two hands don't carry a shabbat but if it's small then you can number 12. you may remove a shoe from a shoemaker's block on shabbat you may release a closed press that, that uh, uh, that's being pre- closed that's being pressed um, on Shabbat, but you may not put the press back in place. But if it's a press belonging to uh, a, someone that does this for business, this is considered a, a, a very precious. Um, machine, and therefore you can't touch it, like we spoke earlier. Um, similarly, unprocessed rolls of wool may, may not be carried be, um, because this is a, a, a desired object. But if you put it set aside in order to be used, you can. It is unpressed hides. Whether it's yours or whether you do this for business, you're allowed to because people are not uh, it's a, it's a people uh, people are not so concerned about these objects. Number thirteen. Anything that is all filth, vomit or excrement or anything like that, you're allowed to move it and put it in the garbage on Shabbat. And if you need to, you can cover it with a vessel, so therefore a utensil, therefore the kids don't get dirty. You're allowed to step on spit on Shabbat. One may carry a warming pan because of its ash, uh, despite the fact that it contains chips of wood, um, that you're allowed to carry on Shabbat. At the outset, you may not bring about the creation of a repulsive, of something that's repulsive on Shabbos. But if it happened on its own, then you're allowed to remove it and you're allowed to take care of it. Um, number 14. It is permitted to partake of oil that flows from the, beneath uh, the beam of the olive press and from the dates and almonds that are prepared to be sold. And also you're allowed to take grain that's piled up because it's food. So you're allowed to touch it on Shabbat. Except for figs and raisins that have been set aside to dry, those you can't because right now they're not ready yet. 
a barrel or a watermelon that was open, maybe carried and stored away, even though it is no longer fit to be eat, to be eaten. Also, amulet that is not proven to work. You're also allowed to carry Shabbat. But if you have leftover oil in a candle that was lit on Shabbat, you're not allowed to because it was considered already muktzah for using it. Now, even though the candle is, has extinguished. Number 15. A, uh, a storehouse that has grains and barrels um, are, is permitted, you're allowed to empty it out if you need the place for mix, uh, for a mitzvah. If you need a storage place for a mitzvah, you need to do, you, you need to do a minion there or you need to host somebody, then you're allowed to, you're allowed to empty it out. Everyone should just take four or five things and walk out, but you can't level the ground. You could just walk back and forth and ho- hopefully with the walking, the ground will be leveled on its own. Number 16. Anything that an animal or a bird can eat, you're allowed to carry Shabbos. What does uh, that imply? You may carry dry tormus beans, uh, but not wet ones. Um, you're allowed to carry um, fresh Tormos bean, uh, sorry, you're allowed to be carry chatzov uh, because it's food for deer, mustard because it's food for doves, and bones because it is food for dogs. Um, you're also allowed to carry any shells or seeds that the animals will eat. What is not what is not can't be eaten by any animals, then you're not allowed to carry. Without the muscle to pork, when they shumachalachai, you may carry meat that has spoiled because certain animals eat it. Without the muscle, chai, bein tafel, bein malef, and they show you you're allowed to carry raw meat, whether it's salted or unsalted, because people eat that. Chain dog maliach, avla also likewise salted fish, but you're not allowed to carry unsalted fish because nobody will eat that. Number 17. Uh, even though ostriches eat broken glass, you're not allowed to carry it. And not bundles of twigs from a vine, even though it's edible by a loof. Because most of these are not um, are not things that most people have, and therefore we're not you're not allowed to carry it. Um, number 18, bundles of straw, bundles of, of wood, and bundles of twigs, if they're prepared to, for animals uh, f- fodder to eat, you're allowed to carry. If not, you're not allowed to carry. Um, if one brought in bundles of wild uh, hyssops or matter or hyssop or, or thyme um, to be used for kindling wood, if it was brought for kindling wood to make a fire, then you're not allowed to um, you're not allowed to use them on Shabbat. But if it was brought for animals to eat, then you're allowed to. Similar rules applies to mint, rue, and other herbs. Number 19. A person may not rake food that was placed before an ox, um, whether it was put on the ground, um, or was put in, in a utensil. And also, you know, I'm going to put it on the side because we're afraid you're going to flatten the ground. You're allowed to take it from one animal and give it to another animal. But you're, you're allowed, what you're allowed to do is take it from, you're allowed to take it, you're allowed to take the food that's placed in front, before a donkey and place it in front of an ox, but you can't take it from an ox in front of a donkey because any any food that was put in front of the ox it becomes very uh, it becomes full of saliva and, be, and no other animal will eat it and therefore you just you can only leave it in front of the ox. Chen all this 
Uh, likewise, leaves that are smell bad, that the animal won't eat, don't, you can't touch them. Therefore, carrying a hook on which a fish was hung is forbidden. By contrast, a hook which meat was hung on it, that is permitted. Number 20. Even though you're not allowed to carry corpse of Shabbat, you're allowed to put oint, you're allowed to wash it and, and make sure you don't move any limbs. You're also allowed to take something that was under the corpse in order that touches the ground so it doesn't smell. You're also allowed to bring utensils that will cool cool utensils like metal or other things to put on the belly in order that the corpse doesn't uh, swell. You also may stop um, different holes in order that ear doesn't get into the corpse. You also may tie the jaw, the jaw of the corpse. Not, not that, not that to close it, but that it doesn't open anymore. We now going to close the eyes of a corpse on Shabbat. Number 21. If a corpse is lying in the sun, you're allowed to put a, a loaf of bread on it or a little baby on it and then carry it because you're allowed to carry a loaf and a baby. So therefore, this is a way to get the, the corpse out of the sun. Like if a fire breaks out, you don't want the corpse to burn up. You want it to give it a proper burial. So you're allowed to take it out on Shabbat. Um, put a child or something that you're allowed to carry on it and then carry it together. And if you don't have a child and you don't have a loaf of bread, you could still just carry the, the deceased the way it is because we're afraid that if we don't let you, you're going to, someone's going to be very anxious about the, the about burying this, the, the, the body properly and they're going to extinguish the fire, which is, a, which that is a real, uh, that, that's really forbidden on Shabbat. So therefore, we let you take out the corpse. Number 22. If let's say the, there's a corpse that's outside and you have nowhere to move it to, but uh, so therefore, what should you do? You don't want the sun to. Uh, to destroy the corpse on Shabbat. So he says two people should come and sit next to the corpse and then it's hot under them. So they put a bed under them. Then it's hot on top of them. They put shade on top of them. Then they walk out and they, they, they move the bed standing upwards. So therefore this corpse now has shade based on the fact that a person came to sit there. Number 23. If there is a corpse that's decomposed in a house, and it's a disgrace for the people that are living there. It's a disgrace for the corpse. You're allowed to move it outside to a Carmelist. It's more important. The honor of the, cre of, of the creations is great enough to, uh, to supersede this that it says in the Torah. That it says, do not swear, do not swear swerve right or left from the words that they, that they, that I will tell you. But if you have another place to hang out to the end of the Shabbat, better you pick yourself up and leave and go to the other, other place and leave the corpse the way it is. But if you don't, and it's, and, and, uh, and it's something that's really bothering you, then you're allowed to take the corpse outside. And with that, we finish chapter number 20. What was this? 26. And the third chapter for today, if you have any questions, please, right now is a good time to, um, right now is a good time to share any questions that you have. Um, let me go through the chat here and see if there's any question. What happens if a poor person picks up fruit on our land and Shabbat, do we shout and call them away? Um, if you if you want them to eat it, then don't shout at them. This was something that you this was something that you didn't that the person didn't want people to touch. But if you want people to take, by all means. Why can't we carry young children on Shabbat, especially to bring them to shul? So it's a good question. Why can't we? Um, 
the you're you're Carrying a child is a, is is a is a good question because really in a certain way you're allowed to carry a child because the carry a child carries itself. So um, if you if the question is if you're holding the child and walking to Shabbat, it may not be such a big problem. You should ask your local rabbi. Uh, the the problem is pushing strollers. These are the things. That's when it comes to, to an issue. Do we hold a knife differently to cut the food on Shabbat differently between the No, you don't have to hold the knife differently. You can hold the knife regularly. That's fine. Uh, uh, it just, uh, just remember, please remember to make your brother Mendy a host once he returns. I cannot. Okay, we'll try to do that. Um, another question. I was wondering if you are close to Santa Monica my nephew lives there. He's not religious. I was on the. Uh, uh, uh. Um, okay. I, I you can uh, text me or email me. Um, whoever sent me that about Santa Monica, uh, you can get my information from my father. Um, Technically, another question. Technology has advanced so much. How do we know which laws are still fully applicable issues today in the same way? So. Um, um, it's a good question. Therefore, we have rabbis that know all the laws and they, um, and they decide which ones are applicable today or not. It's not for me to decide. It's not for us to study the Maimonides and decide. There are rabbis that are very well versed in Torah and very well versed in technology and, they, and those questions they take care of. Um, so a baby that's born an eighth month, that's a uh, usher for writing that, yes. A baby that's born on eighth month is is a uh, halachic question because it's born a little early. So only after it lives for 30 days do we know that it's considered an, a, a, um, a that's considered that's going to live. Um, so of course we take care of the baby in every single way. But on Shabbat there are specific rules for that. How is it okay to carry a baby or, uh, or a bread on a corpse? The reason why it's okay is because we spoke earlier that if you have something that you're allowed to carry and something that you're not allowed to carry together, we said that if you need the thing that has to be carried, then you're allowed to touch even the thing that's not allowed to be carried. So in this case, generally, you're not allowed to do this. But because of the honor we want to give to the corpse, therefore, we allow you to put something that's allowed to be carried on the corpse and carry both of them together. Why is not a corpse buried in mitzvah even on Shabbat? Because it's a good question. Because we wait till after Shabbat for that. We don't. There is no burials that are done on Shabbat. We have to wait till after Shabbat. It is a mitzvah, but because it could be done after Shabbat, let's do. We do it after Shabbat. Um, and with that, we finish the questions on the chat. Are there any other questions here? Okay. Um, um, okay, with that, I see there's no more questions. So with that, we finish um, the Rama for today. And everybody should have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. And look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry to ask. Is it not supposed to be to 26? I thought it was... Um... What? I thought it was the 26. I apologize. I just, uh, I thought it was the chapter 26. Did I make a miscount? Or... Oh, no, that's good. You did good. You did good. Okay, all the best. Thank you so very much. Okay. Thank you.